Um, hello, my name is Ores Hardubelis and I'm really happy to be presenting this joint work with Julia Malavolta titled The Round Complexity of Quantum Zero Knowledge. To begin with, I'm going to start with some introduction about what is zero knowledge and our contribution to its round complexity. So, uh, a zero knowledge protocol probably needs no introduction, but it's basically an interactive protocol where someone, a prover, uh, can prove the rest of a statement to the verifier while revealing nothing beyond that. So let's say we have a prover that wants to prove that X is in the language. And if we assume he has a witness W, we want for the verifier to learn nothing about the witness. Now, a very well studied problem concerning zero knowledge is the number of messages exchanged in the protocol, or in other words, the round complexity of the protocol. This is of very high interest in the cryptographic community, and actually it has been shown that any NP statement can be proven in as few as four rounds of interaction. For completeness, I also want to mention this recent result that achieved zero knowledge in just three rounds, although it was not post-quantum secure, and this is going to be a bit relevant later. Now, um, I've been talking about zero knowledge for NP statements. And what NP is, is a complexity class, where it contains all the decision problems that if the answer is yes, we have proofs that are verifiable in polynomial time by using a deterministic um, a Turing machine. Uh, but if we take a look at this complexity zoo figure, we also notice that there are complexity classes. And we can consider the quantum analog of NP, which is QMA, or quantum burden Arthur, which is the complexity class which contains all of the decision problems that if the answer is yes, now we have a polynomial time quantum proof that can still convince uh, a quantum verifier with very high probability in polynomial time. So an immediate uh, question we have is, do we have zero knowledge for QMA statements? And the answer is yes, we do. So quantum zero knowledge is pretty much the same notion, but now again, we have a uh, quantum statement. So X is quantum and the prover of the verifier can also be quantum. The messages also can be quantum. Now, uh, in the quantum setting, uh, the best known results we have for round complexity is in constant rounds, introduced in 2020 by this paper from Bitaski and Smelly. And uh, what we wondered is uh, whether QMA statements inherently introduce additional rounds of interaction. And that's why we focused on this paper, and we showed that this is not the case. So here are our results. Uh, first of all, we constructed a two-round statistical witness indistinguishability argument for QMA, uh, which I'm going to define later. But then, using this, we were able to compile it into a full-fledged zero-knowledge argument in just four rounds, achieving statistical zero-knowledge. Finally, we also moved uh, our research into the timing model. The timing model is just uh, assuming that parties can measure the lapse of time and use this in the protocol, and we constructed two rounds of knowledge arguments, both uh, computational and statistical, depending on uh, the assumptions. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on these first two results. Uh, but before getting into any constructions, I do want to um, focus and define SBSH commitments because it's a tool that we use a lot in this paper. Now, uh, most of you are familiar with commitment schemes. In a commitment scheme, we have a sender and a receiver and the sender commits to a specific value M in the commit phase that he can later reveal uh, to the receiver. Now, what we want from a commitment scheme is for it to be hiding which means that the message M remains hidden from the receiver during the commit phase. Or in other words, uh, if we have commitments of uh, two different messages, they are indistinguishable from uh, the receiver. Now, uh, we also want for the commitment scheme to be binding, which means after the sender commits to the message M, he can only open the commitment to this message M and not be able to trick the receiver by switching the message. Uh, usually, most commitment schemes can be either uh, 
statistically hiding and computationally binding or computationally hiding and statistically binding. But what we use is sometimes binding statistically hiding or SPSH commitments introduced uh, in this paper here, where you can see that uh, the commitment phase takes uh, three rounds of interaction. And, um, well, as their name suggests, their commitment schemes that they are statistically hiding, which means that uh, the commitment of two different messages, M0 and M1, are statistically indistinguishable from the receiver, but they also all are sometimes binding. And what does that mean? It means that there's a very small and negligibly small probability for the commitment to be perfectly binding. And if that's the case, with very small probability that they are uh, binding, then we can extract the message M with a straight line extraction. So that's pretty much it. And we're going to see how we use them, uh, getting into our first instruction of witness indiscusability arguments. Now, what is witness indiscusability? Well, it's a weaker notion of zero knowledge. Again, we have the same setting. We have a prover and the verifier, and the prover wants to prove some statement X is in the language. Uh, but instead of trying to achieve zero knowledge, what we're trying to uh, achieve is for the verifier to not be able to tell the difference between two valid witnesses used by the prover. And uh, this is exactly what we construct for VMA. But before getting to the construction, I also have to introduce another weaker notion of zero knowledge, or maybe a relaxation of zero knowledge, which is uh, sigma protocols. Now, sigma protocols is just like zero knowledge, but we have to assume an honest verifier. So a sigma protocol usually looks like this. We have three messages. First of all, the prover sends a commitment alpha, then the second message is a challenge beta by the verifier, and then the prover sends his last message uh, gamma, which is a response to the challenge, and uh, that's persuading the verifier. Uh, now, this instance here that we see is a quantum sigma protocol, which was introduced in this paper by Broadbent and Grillo. And a very important property that we're going to use is that the computation of beta and gamma uh, is completely classical. So it's just the first message is quantum. Now, um, <clears throat> in their paper, they prove computational zero knowledge and statistical soundness. But if you remember, uh, when I introduced the results, I've been talking about st statistical WI and statistical zero knowledge. So in order to do that, we have to extend this to statistical zero knowledge, the sigma protocol as well. And uh, of course, computational soundness. Uh, now, this is not a trivial how to do it, and I don't want to get into too much details, but um, so in their protocol, they use statistically binding commitments. And these commitments, they cannot be used uh, in order to prove statistical zero knowledge. So uh, what we do is we replace our commitments with SBSH commitments. Now these commitments are statistically hiding, so we're able to get statistical zero knowledge. Uh, and they're also sometimes binding. Now, since they're sometimes binding in the soundness proof, we have to uh, set the parameter of our derivatives accordingly to uh, still uh, make it secure. And in order to get computational soundness, since we have uh, on the to the knowledge, we can perform a parallel repetition of the protocol and still uh, make it secure and have negligible soundness. Now, having that, I also need to introduce some uh, additional tools and then get into the actual construction. So, first of all, we also need a, a pseudo random function. Now, pseudo random function. Uh, is a protocol where uh, there's a generator that produces a key, and then given the, the key, we can input it into a function that produces a seemingly random string. We also use a an FHC or full homomorphic encryption scheme. Uh, in this scheme, uh, we're able to perform computations under encrypted uh, data. So let's say we have two parties, Alice and Bob. Alice can send an encrypted message, and then Bob can compute evaluations of the message under encryption without having to first decrypt the message. And then finally, we also use a witness in the arguments for and P, 
which is non-interactive, so uh, we can just do it in one round. And for MP, this exists, and here are some constructions. Now, using all this and using the Sigma protocol with statistical zero knowledge, we finally arrived to a construction where the main idea is that we use the fully homomorphic encryption scheme to round collapse the Sigma protocol. So here, as you can see, to the three messages, we have two. And in the first message, the very first sends an encrypted pseudo random function key. And then the prover sends both of his messages at the same time. So given this key, he can sample uh, a challenge using the PRF. But of course, he has to do that under encryption homomorphically because he cannot know the challenge. And then after he He's done that, he can uh, compute his server mes message alpha, and also he can compute his response gamma using the talents. But of course, in order to do that, he has to do it homomorphically under encryption. And that's why he use the FAT. And then after he computes uh, both of his messages, he sends them, sends them back to the verifier. Now the verifier has the secret key of the encryption scheme, so he can decrypt it and get uh, gamma but he can also recompute beta, and then he has the whole transcript and he can check if the sigma protocol is valid. In this protocol, we repeat these messages twice, and the prover sent a WI proof that shows that at least one of the two instances was computed correctly. Now, uh, a WI for NP is sufficient because beta and gamma, the last two messages of the sigma protocol, are both completely classical. So this is enough. And that's uh, pretty much it. Um, we also uh, here include an SB state commitment of the randomness used in the homomorphic evaluation, which is necessary for uh, the soundness um, for the soundness proof. I'm not going to get into too much technical detail, but again, since we're using an SB state commitment, still we can um, achieve statistical WI. But of course, we, we get computational soundness and. Uh, I do want to point out that since we have computational soundness, this is a WI argument, not a proof. And this is a main building block in all of our following constructions, so we have zero knowledge arguments and not proofs. Uh, but also, since we use SPSH commitments, if you remember, I said that there's uh, some exponential loss because we have sometimes binding commitments. A and we have to um, account for it in the other primitives by setting the parameters accordingly. So, in order to still have secure um, protocols, we have to assume quasi-polynomial hardness over the WE. Now, again, since we use this protocol as a building block for all our uh, next constructions, all of our constructions uh, have to uh, assume quasi-polynomial hardness over the WE. Um, now, uh, I'm going to move to zero-knowledge protocols, and before going to any constructions, I'm I want to focus on existing techniques, both classical and quantum, uh, and see what we have to use uh, some of these techniques, how we use them for our protocols. So, first of all, I'm going to go over the classical setting in a bit more details. Now, this is how a zero knowledge protocol looks in the classical setting, usually, it's pretty similar to a sigma protocol. Uh, where the prover sends a commitment alpha that contains the proof, then the very first sends a challenge, challenging the prover, and then the prover partially opened his commitment, revealing a part of the proof, and thus persuading the verifier. Of course, unlike the Sigma protocol, the verifier is not always honest, so we have another message in the beginning where the verifier commits to the challenge so as not to be able to change it after seeing the prover's commitment. Now, um, since the prover cannot see the talents beforehand, uh, he should really know the proof, and that's how we usually um, achieve soundness. But how do we prove zero knowledge? And in order to do that, we have to use a simulator. Now, a simulator is someone who doesn't know the proof, and we show that the output of the simulated interaction is indistinguishable from the real interaction. So. Uh, we show that the simulator can still persuade the verifier without knowing the truth, and thus we have zero knowledge. A very common way of uh, proving zero knowledge is rewinding. So how rewinding works is uh, the verifier in the first message, uh, of course, sends a commitment to the challenge, and then the simulator 
well, he doesn't know the proof, so he has to send a commitment to some garbage, to some string zero. But the important thing here is that uh, the simulator knows the inner state of the verifier. So he can take a snapshot of the inner state here, and then after the very first he commits to the challenge, now the simulator knows the challenge. Of course, it's a little too late, but since he took a snapshot here, he can rewind back to when he took the snapshot, and then he can repeat the protocol by knowing the very first challenge. And now he doesn't have to commit to some garbage string zero, but he can commit to a value that persuades the verifier and tricks him, and thus achieving a transcript that's indistinguishable from the real one. Now, what happens in the quantum setting that we talked about? And in the quantum setting, the most well-known theorem is the no-cloning theorem, which says that there is no quantum procedure that transforms, uh, like given one quantum state, copies it and outputs two uh, identical quantum states. So in the classical setting, the most basic thing you can do is have a string copied and you can perform computations with the string and still have an original copy intact. Here, you cannot do that. And then the quantum procedure uh, changes the quantum state. So why is that important for us? Well, if we try to do the same thing as in the classical setting, now we have a quantum verifier. So the inner state of the verifier is also quantum. So the simulator cannot take a snapshot. So even after the verifier reveals the challenge, he cannot rewind. So it seems like he's stuck. Now, of course, there are simulation techniques that don't use rewinding, but they still directly or indirectly rely on cloning, and uh, we cannot just extend it to the quantum set. So we need another solution, and uh, one solution was given by these two papers, Anna Thelma-Placa and Butaskin Smelly, where they achieve and they construct a linear extraction technique. Uh, this extraction technique is uh, the one we're also going to use the protocol, so I'm going to present it now. Uh, but before being able to present it, I need to uh, introduce some necessary tools. The first one is a quantum free homomorphic encryption scheme. I already talked about a free homomorphic encryption scheme, and this is just the quantum analog of it, where it's pretty much the same notion, but instead of a classical message, we have a quantum state as our message. And of course, both parties can be quantum, and uh, Bob can perform, uh, again, uh, homework computations uh, for any arbitrary unitary U. Unitary matrices are, are what we use in the quantum setting to perform computations. So we have a quantum FHC scheme, and we also use a compute and compare obfuscation program. Now, a compute and compare program, or a CSC program, is parameterized by a function f, a string s, and the method z. And given an input x, this program checks if f of x equals the string s, and if it does, it returns the message z. Otherwise, we get nothing. Now, by using an obfuscator, we can obfuscate this program uh, into the obfuscated program where the implementation is hidden to any adversary. Now, finally, we also use a CDS, or a Conditional Disclosure of Secrets protocol, where, in this case, BOM can send a message to Alice only if a certain statement is correct. So, let's say we have this statement here, conditioned on the witness W that Alice has, so Alice first must send a message that contains his witness, and then Bob sends his message M, that Alice can only get if this statement is correct. Now, all of these tools, I think they're gonna make more sense when I present you the protocol, which we call the homomorphic trapdoor technique. Um, and this is the main idea. We, we have a sender and the receiver. Uh, the sender in the general knowledge protocol is gonna be the very far and the receiver the prover, just to not have any confusion. So here's how it works. The sender, first of all, sends, sends an encryption to some trapdoor, which is an arbitrary string, and also sends a computer compare for scaled program that on input the encryption of some string S, it returns the message along with the secret key. So we have the encryption of some trapdoor and the CSC that given the right input returns the message. 
than the receiver since it guessed Y, guessing the trapdoor that was encrypted here. And finally, the sender sends a conditional disclosure of secrets uh, protocol such that if the receiver guessed correctly, he gets S, otherwise he gets nothing. And if he gets S, he can encrypt it, put it on the CNC obfuscated program and get the message. Of course, uh, this uh, protocol is hiding because the receiver is not going to be able to guess the trapdoor because it's encrypted and due to the security of the encryption scheme, which is free home morph encryption scheme, he cannot guess correctly. But what happens is that if we use an extractor, an extractor again has inner access to access to the inner state of the sender, and thus he can perform this message homomorphically, which means instead of guessing the trapdoor, he's going to have to guess the encryption of the trapdoor, because everything's going to be under encryption, and he does have the encryption of the trapdoor because that's what the first message of the sender was, so he's going to get correctly guess correctly, and then the sender is going to send the CDS that it's going to be satisfied. So he's going to get S. Now, as I said, everything is under encryption, so he's really going to get the encryption of S. But that's exactly what he needs for the CNC program here. So he's going to give the encryption of S and going to get the message and the secret key. And that's uh, that's the main idea of uh, the technique. Now, um, with Task and Schmell in their paper, they use this no cloning extraction, and by combining it with uh, a classical zero knowledge argument and a, the quantum sigma protocol that we saw before, they uh, achieve constant run computational zero knowledge for QMA. What we do in our construction is we use our statistical WI argument, and combining it with uh, the no cloning extraction, we get zero knowledge for QMA but in just four rounds. And as a bonus, we also achieve statistical zero knowledge. And now we have all the necessary building blocks and I can get to the actual construction. Now, uh, in our protocol, we have a prover and a verifier. And in the first message, the verifier sends a commitment to some string zero using randomness R. And then the two parties perform uh, the homomorphic trapdoor uh, technique that we saw before for R as the message M. Uh, now, uh, in that technique, remember the very far would be the sender and the proof of the receiver. So this takes three rounds of interaction. And in the final round, in the fourth round, the prover uses our WI argument to prove that either he knows R or that X is in the language. Of course, the prover wouldn't be able to know R because in the homomorphic trapdoor technique, R was hidden. So he has to prove that X is the language, and thus he cannot see it. On the other hand, the simulator can use the extractor and extract R here, and then prove the first clause from the WI argument. Uh, you can see that we also include an SBSH commitment of the guess Y of the prover, uh, to rule out modeling attacks, uh, because it can be extracted with merciful probability. Uh, it's a bit more technical, but the main reason I'm referring to this is to point out that, again, we're using a space commitment, and still we're able to, in order to be able to achieve statistical as knowledge. Now, this protocol works great for non-malicious verifiers, which means it works for verifiers that are non-aborting and explainable. Uh, a non-aborting verifier is a verifier that doesn't just randomly abort during the protocol. An explainable verifier is a verifier whose messages can always be explained. That doesn't mean that the verifier is always honest, but it means that his messages are computed in support of honest algorithms. Now, what we need to do is to extend this protocol to also malicious verifiers. And I'm going to start with aborting verifiers. So just for a bit of intuition, the reason our simulator fails is that in the um, homomorphic trapdoor technique, if you remember, everything ranks homomorphically. And in the end, uh, when the uh, sender got the message, he also got the secret key because in the end, he had the encrypted inner state uh, of the receiver and he had to decrypt it in order to get a transcript that's indistinguishable from the real interaction. So, uh, 
the main point here is that uh, since everything is homomorphically, he gets stuck under the encryption. Of course, if he, if he knew from the beginning that uh, the sender would abort, then he wouldn't do any homomorphic evaluations and would still be able to persuade the sender. So what we do for our protocol is we follow the template of BS20 and we construct two simulators, one that's aborting and one that's non-aborting. And finally, a combined simulator guesses which one of these two should be used using Quartus' quantum rewinding lemma. Now, this is basically a rewinding for the quantum setting. Of course, it isn't sufficient for an invisible soundness error, and that's why I wouldn't have used it uh, in, just like in the classical setting where we use rewinding, but for this case, it is sufficient. And that's how we extend to abort verifiers. Now, for non-explainable verifiers, the very standard way is to add a proof from the verifier to the prover that the messages uh, are computed honestly. And uh, if you notice, all of the verifier's messages so far have been classical. So zero knowledge for MP is enough. But in order to still have four rounds, we need a three round uh, zero knowledge protocol. And in order to have statistical zero knowledge, we need a zero knowledge proof from uh, the verifier to the receiver. And if we add the proof, then we also extend to non-explainable verifiers, and then we're done. Now, with everything I've said so far, there are two, uh, there, there are a couple of problems, a couple of obstacles. The first one is uh, pretty obvious, is that uh, I said that we need a three-round post-quantum zero knowledge proof, which doesn't exist. Uh, I did mention in the beginning, if you remember, that there does exist a three rounds of knowledge proof, but it was not post-quantum, which means that it was not secure against quantum adversaries. And of course, we cannot use something like this in a quantum protocol. Another problem is that, if you remember, with the homomorphic structure technique, we used as DS protocols. But this only provides computational security for the receiver, and if we want statistical uh, as your knowledge, we want statistical security for the receiver. Now, both of these obstacles can be circumvented by um, constructing a three rounds, sometimes extractable, statistically receiver private oblivious transfer protocol. And that's exactly what we do. I'm not going to get into details about um, the construction, but by constructing this oblivious transfer protocol, uh, we get solutions for both of these problems. Uh, the only thing I want to say is that this is sometimes extractable uh, protocol, which is kind of the same notion as the sometimes binding property of SBSH commitments, and of course we use SBSH commitment to build this. And yeah, after building this, we can use it to get the two-round post-quantum CDS protocol, uh, achieving statistical security for the receiver, but it's still not clear at all how we can get the three rounds zero knowledge proof. And the answer is that we don't. Uh, but what we do is settle for a weaker notion of your knowledge that it suffices for our protocol. And we define this as sometimes simulatable your knowledge. Now, uh, sometimes simulatable your knowledge is, again, the same idea as the sometimes binding property of SCBSH commitments, because simulation is possible with some very small probability. So the simulator with a straight line can run in polynomial time, but just have an exponentially small success probability. And just like uh, a SBSS commitment, there is an exponential loss that we have to account for. So when using these protocols, we have to uh, set the security parameters of the other primitives accordingly. So we need quasi polynomial hardness of LWE, but we already assume that, so uh, it's fine for us. Again, uh, if you want more details about the constructions, you can get uh, check out the full version of the paper. And that's uh, pretty much it. To <clears throat> conclude, I'm going to sum up our results. So, assuming quasi polynomial hardness of LWE and using uh, SBSA commitments as a tool, we are able to, first of all, construct a two round statistical witness in this usability argument for QMA. Then using that, we're able to construct a four-round statistical zero knowledge argument for QMA. And finally, even though I didn't mention the constructions in this uh, presentation, 
we get two rounds during knowledge arguments in the timing model, both uh, computational and statistical concerning the, the assumptions. And uh, we also do that without any trusted setup. Uh, I've also included the link to the full version of the paper if anyone's interested in uh, taking the constructions in more details. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And that's uh, pretty much it. Bye-bye. Uh,